Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. I am Zach, your companion th through the world of permaculture today. That is going to be our topic uh, for today. This is, is part three in my Permaculture 101 series. So uh, if, you're, if you're new to this series, just to kind of catch you up to where we're at, we have gone over the, um, who the founders of permaculture are, that being Bill Mollison, um, who uh, was a, a uh, professor from Tasmania, Australia, and his um, grad assistant, David Holmgren. Uh, we have gone over some of their, their works, uh, their, their most important works, those being uh, Permaculture, a Designer's Manual by David, uh, excuse me, by Bill Mollison, um, and as, as well as Permaculture, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability by David Holmgren. We have gone over the, the ethics of permaculture, those being uh, care for the earth, care for people, and return the surplus to the service of the first two ethics and the, the principles, and because there are 12 principles, and that doesn't seem like that much to, to really keep in your head all at the same time, but it is. <laughs> Let me tell you. Uh, so the, the, the principles, once again, uh, and this is, this is according to David Holmgren, as, as distilled from uh, Permaculture Designer's Manual. He took all of that text and distilled it down into 12 principles. Observe and interact catch and store energy, obtain a yield, apply self-regulation and accept feedback, use and value renewable resources and services, produce no waste, design from the patterns to the details, integrate rather than segregate, use small and slow solutions, use and value diversity, Use edges and value the marginal. And finally, creatively use and respond to, to change. So we've covered that stuff. We've given you a little bit of an intro to um, a permaculture design certification course. Uh, we were actually going through the um, video, this, this wonderful video series from uh, Oregon State University. I'm going to have to pull that back up. One moment. Oh, here we are. Uh, yeah, so it's the OSU Permaculture course intro. And we're going to continue tonight with videos from that. Um, and I'll pause to, to help you understand what's going on. Uh, this, this is a teaching space. So if you have any questions about permaculture, uh, especially as it, as it relates to some of the other things that we talk about, such as um, anarchism, communism, uh, new urbanism, uh, anything to do that, 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 uh, with things that we generally cover on this channel, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. I always enjoy helping people learn and uh, bringing new knowledge to them. So I think we are ready to get going on that. So yeah, don't hesitate to ask. Even if you think it might be a little bit off the, the main topic, as long as we're in the general ballpark, I, I think you uh, can easily accommodate stopping to, to help fill you in. So here we go. Uh, this is the, the second in the video series from OSU. It's called Designer as, Lands, as Land Physician. So it's a kind of a different way of, of looking at the way that humans are on the land. Kind of the, the modern view of, of humans' interaction with nature is that it's always to nature's detriment, right? You put up even a house, might be good for people, but you, you probably have to clear some land out um, that's going to destroy habitat. That's going to, uh, you know, it takes building materials that you have to, to use emissions to, um, get to the site. You have to use fossil fuel. Uh, the house itself will, will pollute, you know, on and on and on. Um, all the way up to, to large scale operations where you're, you know, clearing hundreds of acres to make a single farm. Um, or you are doing, uh, international shipping and all the, the waste that that produces, uh, not just from, you know, the, the, the heavy reliance on fossil fuels, but also through uh, spillage of cargo and just not, there not being regulations out in the middle of the ocean so people can jettison garbage as they, as they please. Um, basically, no matter where you look these days, 
humans interacting with nature is 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 a win lose situation. You know that's how it's framed. Permaculture kind of turns that on its on its head and says that humans can be co creators of their environment, co creators of the ecosystem that they are themselves a part of. Um, and we are part of many ecosystems, especially in, in this modern age where we rely on products from all around the world. Those, those products, uh, to a large extent, come from somewhere in nature, right? You know, uh, if, it's, if it's any sort of wood, then you're interacting with various ecosystems that, that produce that wood. Even if it's something that's been mined, you are, you're, you're interacting with um, ecosystems that are impacted by that mining. Uh, so we are a part of the ecosystems that, that we rely on. You know, that's, that's not just a metaphor or, or a pretty way of looking at it. That's, that's the literal truth. So permaculture is saying, as long as we have to be part of that system, um, as long as we are going to be part of, of all these various ecosystems, let's be a positive impact on it. Let's, let's, uh, there, there, there's a, it's almost a cliche, it's, it's used so often, but uh, there's a saying in permaculture that you want to make your handprint larger than your footprint, right? So uh, the handprint referring to you helping to shape and guide the way that, that ecosystems form and, and reinforce one another and depend on one another, uh, are the various elements depend on one another, um, as opposed to your footprint where you're just doing damage, right? So making your handprint larger than your footprint. So we're going to learn, first of all, about designer as land physician. Here we go. Hello and welcome to Oregon State University's let me know, too, if the volume is good. I'm going to turn on closed captioning as well. Online permaculture design course. I'm Andrew Millison, and I'm one of the instructors for this 10-week journey that we'll be going on together. And, and uh, Andrew Millison is, a, is, I think, himself, he, he definitely has a permaculture design certificate, and uh, I'm pretty sure I've heard him interviewed on, on several permaculture podcasts in the past, so he, he really knows his stuff. He's a good person to listen to. This journey is focused around designing a site through the lens of permaculture. And the course is constructed so that each week and each assignment in this course is a layer in the design process. We start with a very wide angle lens and progressively zoom in to finer and finer levels of detail and complexity in assessing and designing our sites as the course goes on. I'm going to talk to you now about your role in the course as a designer. The aim is that you get into a very intimate relationship with your design site through this process in the same way that a good physician has a relationship with their patient. Really cool how he does these, these intricate drawings. Um, I, I think how this works is, is uh, he does the, the actual drawings themselves, or, or, yeah, themselves, uh, you know, as, as you see it. And then you'll see text kind of fill in. It'd be really hard if you had to do all that text so neatly backwards. So I think they just do it in post-production. Uh, just a little side note. In the same way that a doctor will carefully diagnose and treat a patient's ailments in order to bring them to a state of vitality, we will spend a good part of this course assessing and diagnosing the conditions of our landscape and prescribing a treatment through thoughtful regenerative design. So put on your doctor's hat here as we enter into earth medicine school. Now, <clears throat> week one begins with understanding the climate and the context of your site. This has to do with the physical climate, but also the cultural, social, and economic climate and context of our design site and our region. As the doctor, we're looking at the environment that our patient is in and how environment influences the conditions on our site. In week two, we look at landform. The shape of the land has a great deal of impact on the way in which forces like water and sun move across the landscape. And as physician designers of the site, we're looking at the body type or the constitution of our site. Each piece of land has an orientation towards the sun, a steepness of slope, and underlying geology. And in this week, we'll learn about the influences of landform by observing patterns and characterizing those patterns on our design sites. So, so these, uh, 
different facets that he's talking about in, in doing your initial design are, are what's known as um, just a, a simple design analysis. Um, they also often referred to as, as zone and sector analysis. Analyses, I guess, is the, the plural there. <laughs> um, and so, so we'll get more into those terms, but just, just uh, watch for those terms coming up. The following week, we'll learn about site analysis. In the previous week, we began to observe patterns when looking at landform. In the site analysis week, we differentiate those patterns to really map out and understand what the important influences are on our sites. At this stage in the process, we're performing a diagnosis. What are the conditions and the ailments of our design site? What's really working for our site to enhance vitality? What are the major issues that need to be addressed? We'll answer these questions through mapping tools for site analysis. Finally, this next week is on design. Now, many people want to jump right into design because it's the fun and creative part. I mean, this is a design class, but the design needs to unfold naturally from a thoughtful and protracted observation and analysis process. I mean, you wouldn't expect a doctor to prescribe a treatment without doing a thorough diagnosis, right? Thank you for the so, follow. The we're still in the early stages of the treatment plan for our sites. Oh. But in this week, uh, we're going to oh, introduce the me, principles and methods that we use. Uh, I seriously hope that that, uh, that your, your handle is, is tongue in cheek or in other, in, in other ways, in some way, uh, ironic. Because <laughs> this, this is definitely not the place to be denying viruses and stuff. in permaculture design. So up to this point in the course so far, we've been examining our sites in the same way that any good designer might. This week, we learn the unique permaculture tools and perspectives for providing treatment. This next week, we begin to go into the specific layers of design for the various systems that we'll be developing. So we're basically in the, the bibliography of the course. I, I really like how he lays this out so we can Remember it as we come back to each section, but this is this is these are the places the course is going to be taking us, um, and so this is this is not going to be as in depth as an entire seventy-two hour permaculture design course, but it's it's going to be a pretty good overview of the sort of things that that you would expect to learn in an actual PDC. Now the first two layers we'll be looking at are water. Well, hello, bread crochets. Um, just learning about permaculture today. So this is permaculture 101. This is part three in the series. Um, how are you doing today? Uh, and and what, do you, what do you know yourself about permaculture? Are you uh, new to the subject area? Have you um, encountered it before? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts? And access. We assess and design for water and access first because they determine the primary flow and circulation of both water and human energy on our site. The way that water flows and people move become the circulatory patterns on which other subsequent design layers are built on top of. Water resources represent the basic vitality of our site and determine the overall potential of what we can do there. Now we- <laughs> Permaculture is good. Well, hey, you're off to a good start then. That's, that's a really good basis for uh, <laughs> coming to understand these, these ideas that surround it. So yeah, not bad. We may end up shaping the land to intentionally design for storage and movement of water, changing and enhancing the patterns in which water moves above and below ground. But first, we design for the movement of water, and then human circulation, structures like roads and pathways, follow from those. I have to say, too, bread crochets, those are some pretty cool emotes you got going on. Are those from your own channel, or did you get that from somewhere else? Curious to know. After water and access, we're going to look at soils and subdivision. We will now assess what the soil types and soil conditions are on the site and begin to look at ways that subdividing the landscape into soil management areas can enhance the fertility and vitality of our design. Designing for soil fertility is like creating the digestive system of our design, where raw materials are transformed into rich soil through composting, cover cropping, many other methods. We'll look at the tools and tactics for creating abundant growth potential with soil management strategies. <laughs> Bread friends, that's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I can't wait. 
until uh, you know, hopefully I make um, affiliate at some point in the in the not too distant future, and I can start doing uh, custom emotes of my own. But that's that's really cool. Thanks for sharing those. And at this stage in our process, analyzing and assessing soil conditions will provide a good basis when we get. And an important note too. Uh, when doing um, permaculture stuff, or w when using permaculture design, uh, generally you want to keep the living soil intact as much as possible because those are the, it, it's one of the most vital components of, of growing any food, is having a, a living and diverse soil web. And so for what a lot, what a lot of uh, permaculture practitioners um, do then, or, or, or what that means to them, is that they don't till because that can destroy uh, a lot of living soil microorganisms, especially uh, fungi networks, uh, these mycelia that just kind of spread out through, throughout the, the um, surface and the, and the lower, um, or I should say the upper um, few inches of the soil uh, that, are, that are so important for nutrient exchange between plants and, and that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's hard to find any plants that are not dependent in one way or another on fungi. Uh, to, to get all the nutrients that they need. Um, so it also means trying to minimize the use of any sort of, of biocides because, you know, even if you don't intend to, even if it's, a, if it's a, say, an herbicide that's designed for one particular type of plant, uh, that doesn't mean that it doesn't also kill other things. Um, and many of these things can persist in the soil for, for quite some time. Even, even the... the so-called water-soluble ones like uh, Roundup. Um, if you get that in your compost pile, uh, you can be dealing with its effects for, you know, it can be years that it's still stunting the growth of your plants. So, yeah. Had to fight for your political images. Oh, interesting. Love to hear more about that. That's, that's uh, cool. That it, it, I guess you've won that fight, though. So, that's cool. Uh, oh, I see it's a... It's a crochet hook with the, the sickle. That, that's very clever. I like it. Get into plant design. Now that we've looked at our soils on the ground, we can turn our heads up to the trees. This week... Oh, <laughs> Bread Crochet says the only biocides I use are gardening gloves and a fly swatter. Well, that's, that's, that's appropriate technology. That's, I would call that. Um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, I, I do landscaping for a living, and there's a lot of plants that I would not want to be touching without gardening gloves. Lots of thistles and stuff that I have to deal with when I'm weeding beds and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's, that's a good piece of technology, very simple. Um, and yeah, fly spotter, yeah, pesky flies. We look at trees and other long-term permanent vegetation. Trees are literally the respiratory system of our planet, and will give per- I mean, that's, that, that's somewhat true. Trees do produce oxygen. What produces most of the oxygen, um, if I remember correctly, is uh, single-cell organisms in the ocean. Um, I think it's various algaes and stuff like that that actually produce most oxygen. So the way it, it tends to work is like, um, even for a very dense system like, like the Amazon, it produces a lot of oxygen, but there's so much that, that oxygen you know, creates so much um, potential for other bioactivity, I guess, uh, that it tends to all be consumed within the same region. So you're not, you know, it's not exactly true that, like, you know, the Amazon is powering the, the oxygen-creating system for the entire world. It's, it's mostly for the local region, and that, that tends to be the case wherever you go. You get the, the um, any sort of excess in oxygen from uh, ocean living single cell organisms, but yeah, not, not a major difference in what he said. Permanent respiration to our designs. Trees are a long-term element and investment on- Oh, you know, I, I, I was not aware that foxglove can irritate your skin. That's interesting. Um, they're very beautiful flowers. Um, if you haven't seen any, uh, any of you listeners or, or viewers out there, you should definitely check them out, especially if you live in a, a temperate climate. Really wonderful flowers, reliable perennial. Uh, plants good good for like bumblebees and stuff too. They have you know usually have wide enough bell-shaped flowers that the bumblebee can get up in there. So good stuff on our sites. So their planning and planting happens early on in the design process. Tree placement will follow the patterns of water flow and access, 
and will be part of the long-term major infrastructure of our design sites. <laughs> you want to perennials because money. You know, it's funny that most people think of it the other way around because at garden centers, annuals tend to be much, much cheaper um, per plant and, and per surface area covered than perennials. But at least in temperate climates where they're um, their seeds are not viable, like they, they would freeze over the winter and, and not reproduce the next year. Um, so climates like mine, um, long term, yeah, for sure, perennial plants that are suited to the climate are going to be much better uh, bang for the buck because they'll just keep coming back and keep producing um, annuals. You, some annuals are okay uh, to, to save the seed, like they're really easy to save, like um, marigolds, um, what else? Cosmos, um, zinnias, stuff like that. They're, you know, they'll produce a really easy to, to, to access seed head, and you can tell when it's ready. You just pluck it up, and you can you can save it pretty easily and get it year after year. But but still, perennials is, is usually going to be your best bet for, for long-term stuff. Gardens and animals are the next layer that we'll be looking at. Where trees are permanent fixtures in the landscape, annual or short-lived perennial gardens and animal systems are more ephemeral. Crops are rotated and changed. Animals are moved around the site with individuals coming and going throughout the life of the entire design system. Cycles of germination, birth, death, and setting seed happen frequently in this design layer. So this is more akin to the reproductive system with continual cycles of procreation and propagation taking place in garden and animal systems. The next layer we will look at will be the human environment of structures and settlements. Housing and the patterns of neighborhoods, villages, towns, and cities become the bones or the skeletal system of our, of our design. This week, we're gonna- Ah, so, so Brett Crochets again says, bulb flowers are my favorite. I love bulbs too. There's some really nice ones that I like to grow every year, like uh, daffodils and, um, what can I think of? Hyacinth. Hyacinth is one of my favorite. Um, it's it's got it's that purple one that's on the stalk. It's got these tiny little bells that that you know like puts out in in layers basically, um, and it's just so fragrant. It's like they, they say it's like opening a perfume bottle in the house if you have it inside, and that's that's absolutely true. Um, oh, so it's, I'm, I'm I'm sorry to hear that that uh, someone stole your your bulbs and only have a tiny plant left. Oh, that's too bad. Tiger lilies, yeah, tiger lilies are quite beautiful too. And uh, you can eat tiger lilies flowers, um, all the day lily species. You can eat their flowers of. It tastes a lot like lettuce. It's a, it's a nice way to really, you know, beautify a salad if you're if you're going for that sort of thing. Um, but I'm I'm sorry to hear that they got stolen from you. That sucks. A look at the human environment and appropriate ways to construct that environment in the different climate zones on the planet. There are common patterns that we find across the world in villages and settlements that we will learn from to influence our design sites. The last week of the course. Yes, and, and, and just a, a, a caveat on, on that bread crochets. I, I have myself eaten uh, tiger lilies and daylily petals myself. Never had any problem with it. But, you know, I'm just a guy. <laughs> I, I'm sure you know, but I'm just a guy on the Internet, so always if i'm giving out advice on what's edible and not always best to to check it as well oh hello ali osher um yeah uh, so everyone who's who's watching right now uh bread crochets uh a great leftist um streamer please, please please follow them they they do as as the name suggests they they listen to uh theory uh similar to the what i do on on fridays uh while they crochet things it's pretty cool and then Ali Osher, another another great um, leftist streamer, does a lot of political political content. Tends to cover like uh, presidential press conferences lately. That seems to be a lot of what what Ali's doing there. So please give them a follow as well. Um, and good good to see you both in chat today. Welcome. We'll look at energy and economy. Electrical energy systems enable us to run lighting, tools, and many other devices. Financial energy allows us to secure access to land and develop resources. The places in our system and lives where we choose to focus money and energy are places in which we can craft and direct development and growth. So in a way, energy and economy 
are the nervous system of our design, where resources are directed based on information and feedback. I think that's kind of cool how he so there tries to, to link all this into um, the idea of a, a functioning human body with its different systems and stuff. It's kind of cool. There you have it. The outline of the course and our entire permaculture design course curriculum as a process of applying design medicine to our design sites. This curriculum covers the three primary learning goals for this course, which are, number one, identify the major local forces that need to be addressed with design. Number two, develop literacy in permaculture terms, concepts, and strategies. And number three, demonstrate competency in the permaculture design system. There's only one more thing we need to cover in this introduction, and that's about the role that you play in this process. We've identified you as the designer and also as the doctor going through the process of diagnosis and treatment on your design site. But as the designer or physician, you're really not separate from the whole thing, especially if you're designing your own homestead house or land, then you are part of it. Now, I was recently speaking to a friend of mine who's a Chinese medicine doctor, and he explained how in their inner tradition of Chinese medicine, the covenant between the patient and the doctor is that their relationship is one that serves them both. The true purpose of the doctor in that tradition is to help to align the patient with the highest potential for their life, health, and vitality, enabling them to fulfill their destiny, you might say. So your role is to enable the highest potential on your design site, both for the vitality of species and natural systems and for the health, well-being, and prosperity of the human residents. So as the designer, you are pumping the life into the permaculture system. So you may have guessed it by now, you are the beating heart of your permaculture design system. So welcome to the class and I wish you all the success. Cool, so, so that's an idea of where we'll be headed in this, this next series of videos. Um, we have quite a few videos to get through, but they're all pretty short. They're, they're um, usually about five minutes long. This one was a little bit longer to, to intro all of it, but if this sounds interesting to you, then you know just uh, get ready because we're gonna dive into each concept uh, one by one. Thank you. We arrived at the final element of the permaculture decision-making matrix, I guess the we're permaculture gonna... design principle. Well, this, this will be good for those of you who haven't uh, seen the previous streams on this topic. Uh, he's going to go through the, the permaculture principles first. Principles. Here are my two favorite books, which are the two books that we've, we've talked about. Uh, and you can find, let's see, where's that one? You can find a, a PDF of this book for free, Permaculture Designer's Manual. It's fantastic read. It will, you know, it'll tell you most of what you need to know about permaculture. Um, so just, just search for a free PDF of it and you can find it. Uh, yeah, can't, can't recommend that enough. Let's see where we're at. And then uh, David Holmgren's book is, is still in print. The reason I suggest that you use the PDF of Permaculture Designer's Manual is because it's out of print now. So the copies that you can find tend to be quite expensive and really it's, it's being given away for free. And it's, it's been out long enough. I mean, Bill himself has, has passed away just a, a few years ago and he wrote it in, I believe, 88. So it, it's had its time to make its money back, so you shouldn't feel bad about um, taking advantage of that. Uh, but then again, uh, Permaculture, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability by David Holmgren, the other co-originator of the permaculture concept. Um, that came out in 06, I believe. So, you know, there's, there's plenty of places you can find it for, you know, a relatively affordable price. So. Source of the Principles. Bill Mollison included a comprehensive list of principles in the Permaculture Designer's Manual. And later on, David Holmgren consolidated and repackaged the principles into 12 in his book, Permaculture, Principles and Pathways. And we were talking about those principles earlier. I, I mentioned them briefly. Uh, you can go to permacultureprinciples.com and, and look at, at a little more in-depth description of, of each of them. They have them kind of arranged as, as a clock. And in the middle is supposed to represent the, the three ethics of permaculture, uh, care for the earth, care for people, and return of surplus to the first two. 
ethics, um, or the, or to further the first two ethics, I should say. And so then the, the principles are, al are arrayed all around. So you can find out more by going to, uh, yeah, permacultureprinciples.com. Ways beyond Video. sustainability. So for simplicity's sake, I'll present to you Holmgren's 12 principles. <clears throat> Principle one is observe and interact. And this is essentially what we've been talking about for this entire course thus far. Where am I? What are the forces present on my site that I need to design for? Climate, topography, water, soils, vegetation, wildlife, wind, fire, people. These are some of the elements that are part of our observations. Principle two is catch and store energy. Energy is not just electricity, but stored water represents potential energy in the form of irrigation water for future crops. The biomass of a forest represents a living storage of building materials, fuel, nutrients, and water. Not to mention uh, medicine, uh, as well as, as food, not just for yourself, but for uh, animals on your land, whether you're managing those animals or not. Um, yeah, lots, lots of ways that you can interpret uh, stored energy. It could even be in knowledge. Knowledge is another way that you can capture and store uh, energy. Alternative energy systems can turn wind, sun, and flowing water into electrical energy. <laughs> I just had to laugh at that drawing because <laughs> that, that's the absolute worst place to place a, a turbine. You want to have it on a ridge top um, right there. It's not going to catch nearly as much wind. I just, I just thought that was funny. So this principle gives us the directive to capture and grow surpluses in our system. Principle three is obtain a yield. This principle promotes self-reliance and gives us the directive to reap a harvest from our permaculture system because you can't work on an empty stomach. And, and the idea too is to get more out of the system than you are putting into it. If you're having to put in tons of say fertilizer, um, it, um, even even things like time and energy uh, that you're working, um, but, uh, but, but also more tangible things like if you have to uh, heat a greenhouse and and that's that's you know costing a whole lot more in energy than you're actually getting out in 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 energy you can you can measure it calorically you could you could say like you know how many uh how many calories worth of energy am i putting into the system how many how much am i getting out you always want to be getting out more uh than you put into it because that that shows that your system is is um as he says, kind of self-sustaining, self-perpetuating, even even regenerative to the point where you can grow the abundance on the site. Um, but ideally, you get it to the point where the only inputs are things like rain, sun, um, heat produced by, by living things, um, or even by a little bit of, of the stuff that's grown on site, like, like wood or whatever. And then what you're getting out of it is a whole lot more. Uh, you're getting food. You're getting um, the, the five F's, basically, food, fodder, which is animal feed, um, pharmacy, fuel, and, and fiber, which means, like, building materials and, and stuff like that. Um, so you're getting all that stuff back out in, in greater abundance than you're putting in. And, and the only way that can work um, sustainably is, is to have the inputs being from the sun, basically, and, and, and the, the natural processes that the sun you know, pushes around the earth, like wind, rain, stuff like that. This principle is relevant when making a choice about which tree to plant in a location. Always choose the one with greater and more diverse yields over an ornamental plant. Yields are not just... F so another term for that is, is, is stacking functions. So each function, maybe your function is, is food production. So instead of relying on one thing to give you all your food production, so planting an entire field of corn, we're going to diversify. We're going to have multiple sources of food production. But then also, each element in your system, so say you have an apple tree, not only does that provide food, but it can also provide wood, it could provide shelter, it could provide shade for other plants, um, or for yourself, or for your animals. Um, 
these sorts of things. So each element performs multiple functions. It's a way of building resilience into the system. So say you have some sort of a, a, uh, a blight that comes through your, your farm. Say it's like a, a potato blight or something like that. Yeah, your potatoes may be gone for that year. They may be gone for forever, depending on how bad the blight is. But you haven't put all your, you know, metaphorical eggs in one basket. You have different places you can draw from, from and, and uh, fall back on if, if your one element fails, right? Same is true of, of um, you know, each, each element performing multiple functions. So, like, if you have... Um, if you have one tree that provides shade, you might also have a, a built structure out in the field that provides shade. So you're not just relying on one or the other. You have you have multiple things you can fall back fall back on if one element fails. So that's the basic idea. Food yields can be building materials, fuel, wood, nectar for honey. But plenty of food growing all around you is true security. <laughs> Principle four is apply self-regulation and accept feedback. This principle directs us to live simply and consciously. Probably also not a great place to put your house on the land. You don't want it to be on the lowest point. Um, that's going to be the most apt to flooding. Uh, it's, it's probably going to be one of the most exposed places. So but yeah, it's just for illustration purposes. I thought it was kind of funny though. Limit our own consumption because no one else is gonna do that for us. We need to keep our own consumption and emissions in check because that is our responsibility when we care for earth and care for people. Accepting feedback means that learning from our successes and mistakes is an imperative. So like, you really wanna have apples on your, on your uh, piece of land. You love apples, you love the taste and stuff like that. So you get a bunch of apple trees. You do everything uh, that you can to learn about growing them. You do your best to grow them. And then it turns out, well, in the case of apples, that they're very hard to manage, even if you manage them organically. It's very hard to manage apples in North America because of a particular pest that is a native pest. It, it's, it's, um, it's, its usual um, target fruit is hawthorn. But it also loves apples because they're they're from the same family of, of plants, uh, so it will just it'll be just fine going over to your apple tree, and and devouring you know whatever it can, or or at least putting a, a you know a, a, its larvae will put a little pinprick in your apple and start eating its way through. So it's going to ruin your apple crop unless you manage things um, one way or another, and if you manage it. Without being organic, that's that's tons. It's one of the most pe one of the most uh, pesticide um, riddled or, or applied plants of any agricultural crop. So they, they spray a rotation of like three different pesticides week after week after week through the entire growing se uh, season. Alternatively, you can do it organically, um, and there's different techniques that people have come up with, like spraying. Uh, a liquid clay onto the apples to, to harden them and make them harder for pests to get. Um, you can, you can, once the, the blossom has been pollinated, you can slip a little piece of nylon over each individual blossom because each blossom turns into a, an apple. Uh, but I mean, it, it should seem pretty obvious that these things have their drawbacks. It takes a lot of work because if you're, if, even if you're doing the clay thing, you're, reapplying it after every time it rains and in minnesota it rains usually once a week during the the warmer months so you're doing this every week going out and spraying in spring you may just decide then after all of that that the feedback is apples are not a good choice for my spot as much as i love apples as much as i, I love making different things from the apples apple pie apple jam or, or apple butter uh, whatever it may be maybe that's not the best option. So then you, then you go and look at a different fruit that may be a suitable alternative. So that's, that's the sort of thing that they're driving at with accepting feedback. You could have really great plans that they could look really good on paper, but they just don't pan out when, when it comes to reality and, and your local ecosystem. And you may not be able to anticipate it ahead of time, but you have to be ready to anticipate that and change is necessary. And should lead to better choices as we learn what works and what doesn't. 
principle five is use and value renewable resources. Renewable resources are those which replenish with modest use. This could be sustainable forestry or fishing practices. So it's not just energy. This could mean planting an orchard downslope from a forest to take advantage of the nutrient and water drift that continually moves down the hill. That, that tends to be the case that <clears throat> the top of any ridge line is going to be the, the most, uh, it's going to have the most movement of, of nutrients. Just It just makes sense, right? Rain rains on the top, washes dissolved minerals and, and, and other nutrients through the soil down to the valley. Valleys tend to be naturally the most um, fertile and productive places, which is why you'll often see farms in the valley, right? Um, we can we can do things to change that. Um, there's there's a system called key line design. It's a, it's a little bit older than the concept of permaculture. It was by I think the name was P. A. Yeoman, and he came up with a way of of doing this this subsoiling plow, where you can direct water along basically the same level of contour. Like you've ever seen a, a topographical map, and it's got all the different lines. Each line represents a different elevation point, right? So imagine just plowing along one of those lines in a way that you're redirecting the water to stay basically within that same zone. So you can you can make more of that that slope uh, fertile if you do these sorts of techniques, and it works perfectly with permaculture principles and ideas. This is the wind. This is the fact that plants and animals breed, and if we're responsible and careful many of these resources can provide in perpetuity. The next principle, number six, is produce no waste. And we talked a lot about this in the, the last um, Permaculture 101 stream. We, we looked at growing power, uh, which is a, an aquaponics facility. And what aquaponics is, is it's taking the waste product or, or the needs of two different growing systems and putting them together in a way that they in fact feed one another. So aquaponics comes from aquaculture, which is just growing plants, or uh, I'm, I'm sorry, come, we'll start with hydroponics. It comes from hydroponics, which, which is just growing plants in an aqueous medium of nutrients, the various nutrients that they need. Um, the problem with that one tends to be that you have to, to import a lot of nutrients, and they, they often are artificially created, um, may not be really great for releasing into the wider environment, um, and it, it just expensive, you know, expensive to, to keep having to put nutrients into the system. So that's, that's hydroponics. Then you have aquaculture, which is the growing of fish, um, generally in a, in a tank or a pond, for, for food production, basically. Um, the difficulty with that is that they produce waste, you know, they, they defecate into the water. Uh, and you need to do something with that because if you don't, if, if, if the, the nitrate levels uh, build up too much from their waste, they will die. They, they won't be able to get enough oxygen. They will, they will suffocate and die. So what you do then is you combine these two systems together. You, you take the, the fish waste and you pump it out with the water into grow beds uh, where you grow various fruits and vegetables. The, the, the water goes just down into the, the soil, which is, is often not literally like dirt, but, but in fact, like uh, they use like, uh, clay pebbles or they use rock or something like that, something that's not going to dissolve and, and wash through the system, right? Just mainly there to hold the plants in place and then also to, to be a spot where uh, bacteria, beneficial bacteria can grow that converts um, the, the fish waste into something that can be used by the plants. Then the plants take up that, those nutrients, they use them to grow faster. Uh, it's like a, 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 it is a natural fertilizer, right? So the plants do better and they also at the same time are cleaning the water for the fish. So there we have taken uh, potentially a lot of waste by doing these two, diff these two systems differently uh, and we've put them together in a way where waste product uh, feeds into the, the healthy functioning of the other system, right? So that's, that's one way you can produce no waste. That's, that's 
sort of the concept that they're looking at. You look at how virtually all waste is food for something else. Um, gets to be a little trickier when you're talking about like waste from power plants and stuff like that, especially like uh, coal power plants and you look at electronic waste and stuff like that as well. But what we're talking about, when we're talking about food production, you want to have the waste from one system feeding another system all in the same general area. This is where we make the waste of one part of our system the food for another. This means we compost, clean and recycle gray water, repair and re repurpose broken tools and equipment, reduce, reuse, repair, recycle. This also means we don't waste people by having them do hazardous and meaningless work. Principle seven is design from patterns to details. This is one of my personal favorites. It means that first we study the climate, topography, watershed, ecology, and we get a big picture vision of how we can interact with the land and community in a regenerative way. And then our design decisions are based on that. So this road I just drew in is placed in a way where it harvests the water for this pond. The detail of road placement was based on the overall pattern of water flow in the landscape. And again, this, this is a simplified version. There's a lot of waste products that can come off a road. There's, there's copper from the brakes wearing down. There's, you know, chemicals in the asphalt. There's a number of things you wouldn't want to have in a food growing pond. But there's ways to mitigate that with, with a series of, of ditches to filter. Oh, I had a bug on my back. Whoops. <laughs> uh, to, to filter out that, that waste before it um, gets to the pond. And then you can have clean water. So there are ways to do this. This is just a simplified drawing. Just thought I'd point that out. Principle eight is integrate rather than segregate. This principle says that the more relationships between parts of your systems, the stronger, more productive, and more resilient your system becomes. This has to do with community as well. I drew a cluster of dwellings where a cooperative community can get much more done than an individual. Many hands make light work. <clears throat> Principle nine. So are these, are these making sense to you guys so far? Any questions about the, the various principles we've talked about? Love to hear it if you have any. Is use small and slow solutions. I've gone ahead and harvested some of the trees on the forest edge to use for fence posts and replace them with nut trees that will start bearing in about 10 to 12 years and will then live for hundreds of years. I've planted new trees over here, which will be new fence posts when these ones rot. I've also inoculated edible mushrooms into the stumps of the trees I cut which will produce for years and then spread to others with the fallen wood. These are all... So Brad Crochet says it all makes sense. Just the nitty gritty of actually planning uh, something is difficult. Yeah, for sure. And, and we're going to go pretty slowly through um, these different details. We're just, again, we're covering the broad strokes first and, and then we'll drill. We're going to go from the patterns to the details, which is one of the principles. All examples of playing the long game using the small and slow design principle. Principle 10 is use and value diversity. You can see we've got housing, gardens, wind power, water storage, composting, gray water, forestry, orchards, and now I've added in rotational grazing of animals, both here and in the orchard. I've also added more trees and gardens around the homestead and fish to the pond. Diversity is one of the key aspects of permaculture. We want to conserve diverse native habitats and make our human habitats rich with an abundance of many productive elements. Diversity is also resilience. If one part of our system fails, there are others that will thrive. Prince that, that's a, a huge component of designing things to be resilient. That's that's the, the whole thing is, is oftentimes you have a, a trade off between efficiency and resiliency. Efficiency is a good use of materials. You know, you, you have one tree and, and you use every square inch of it to produce 
whatever, um, whatever products you make out of. That's efficient, but it's not necessarily resilient. If you have one tree, you cut it down, and then you're left with nothing left, right? That that's not gonna withstand, you know, use over generations. If you have a lot of trees, though, and you only take a certain amount, um, and you you manage things pretty well, then you can you can build in resilience so that if there is um, some major problem, you may lose a few trees, uh, but you're not going to lose all of it. That's that, that's the, the basic dynamic between efficiency and resiliency. And usually permaculture tries to, to trend towards um, resilience over anything. Principle 11 is use edges and value the marginal. I've added edible hedgerows around the animal paddocks and along the road. I've also added bamboo down below the pond, which will be sub-irrigated by water that seeps down. The edges and margins are great locations to add more productive species or habitat zones, and I can use them to create further layers of productivity. Principle 12 is creatively use and respond to change. One word on the, the using the edges. Um, we'll get to it eventually, but there's a there's a technique developed by the Aztecs in in Mexico. Um, I, I think the the word is chinapas, but basically it's these these reed beds that they weave together with with mud to create these floating raft systems, and then they they go out basically like fingers onto a body of water. Um, so you have a lot of edges, you have a lot of interaction between the water and the more drier land. And they're some of the most productive systems in existence. So that it's just one of the, the few examples of where using those edges really, really works out to, to produce a, a heck of a lot of food. Um, the same thing would be true of a, a, a aquaponic system. That's really using the edges a lot. In fact, as, as we looked at in uh, the last one of these permaculture streams, um, you can even stack beds on top of each other. So you, so you have a grow bed up, uh, you know, at the top, and the water filters down to the, the grow bed below it and down into the fish pond beneath that. So you really are creating a, an efficiency and, and a lot of edges that interact with each other. I noticed that with the orchards and hedgerows growing in, the forest soils growing spongier from the mushroom inoculation, and the soils building from the animal rotation, water has begun to move much more slowly down the hillside. So much so that this area at the bottom of the hill is becoming somewhat of a marsh. Well, that wasn't what I planned, but I'm gonna creatively use that change, and I'm gonna carve out some low areas that'll stay really wet, which I can use to grow edible wetland plants, and then simultaneously build up these peninsulas full of edge to grow produ productive trees which will get their roots down in this water table. Wow, I didn't even see that yield coming, but there you have that, That's a very similar principle to the, the Chinapas. Um, so you, so you see, instead of having just one big open lake, you've created a lot more surface area, right? A lot of more space to um, for each element to interact with one another. So we have all kinds of potential gains from that sort of a thing. Habit, the permaculture principles in action. So let's just dive right in and talk about the first piece of the permaculture decision-making matrix, topography. The shape of the land and how a topographic feature like a mountain range is oriented in relation to the sun and bodies of water will tell us a lot about where we are. The side of a mountain range that's facing the direction of prevailing weather gets more precipitation and creates a rain shadow on the other side. As we go from the ocean into the interior of the continents, it gets drier. Tall mountains intercept weather moving through, as you can see in this diagram of the western U.S. Yeah, okay, so he was just about to talk about it, but um, yeah, you can see that as as you get east of the Rockies, there's, it's basically a uh, desert because as he, said, uh, as he was talking about, all that moisture has been taken out of the air by having to go up over 
mountain ranges. That's a real world example. US, from the Pacific Ocean to the Rocky Mountains. These mountain ranges store snow at high elevations to slowly release into rivers below. Buildings have many design considerations when planning a permaculture system, and their designs are specific to each climate and to the available materials and skill sets. One major design theme is to plan for passive comfort. This means that the design of the building creates a comfortable environment that doesn't require excessive energy for heating, cooling, and lighting. This is accomplished by the building's orientation, layout, and materials. The layout and orientation are also key to maximizing natural light, which saves electricity for artificial lighting. Another major design theme is to build using local and natural materials as much as possible. Every location has materials that are available and don't need to be shipped in from far. To get a clue about what materials can be used, look at what indigenous people built structures out of. Whether it's adobe in the southwestern US, thatch in Indonesia, or wood on the west coast of North America. There are too many different climate zones and building types on the planet to go over in detail in this short presentation. But I'm going to give you a very basic outline of what the major building themes for deserts, equatorial tropics, and cool temperate regions are. The design strategies for other climate zones tend to be hybrids of these major strategies, like in the subtropics, the cold deserts, the warm temperate climates, and at high elevations in the tropics. My real goal here is to just pique your interest so you look further into this for your unique climate conditions. We're going to start in the desert. As we've learned, deserts are not usually located on the equator. They tend to be further north or south, so they tend to have warmer and colder seasons based on the movement of the sun. Even warm deserts tend to require some heating in winter, and this increases the further you get from the equator. This is why desert buildings are oriented towards the sun for solar gain in wintertime, and this is where most of the windows should go. Windows should be limited on the north and east sides, with little or no windows in the west or the If you're on the, the northern hemisphere, that is. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it's, it's uh, windows should be oriented towards the north, right? But the other two parts are the same because the sun keeps going across the, the sky in the same direction or at least we perceive it too. Hot late afternoon summer sun beats down. The rest of the sides of the house should be shaded with wide overhangs. Trellising and plantings can be connected to the house for more shading and cooling. Trees should be- One of the cool things about uh, trellising and plantings too is uh, especially if you're in more of a temperate uh, area where, where plants lose their leaves in the winter time, you can make it so you have shade from, from leaves during the summertime, uh, which keeps the, the direct sun off your building and, and really drastically can reduce the, the amount of, of heating or cooling necessary. Um, they, they say that like, uh, I, I saw something recently, they talked about just like open asphalt, which, um, you know, you have the sun shining straight onto the asphalt. Just putting trees that, that overhang that asphalt can reduce the temperature on a hot summer day between uh, you know 20 to even 40 degrees Fahrenheit so it can do similar things for your home just keep just keeping the Sun off of your house or your building whatever it may be uh, can really help you need that 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 cooling less uh, and and it'll just keep your your shelter much cooler on its own and then also because the angle of the Sun is different in the summer and the winter, if you have the overhang right, um, the, the sun will come down at such a sharp angle in the summertime that it will your your entire side of your house will be shaded on the hottest part in the hottest parts of the day, right, from like ten o'clock to two o'clock. Um, and then in the winter time, though, because the angle is lower in the sky of the the sun coming in, it, you'll have much more uh, penetration of sun into your into your house through the windows and then also just just heating the side of your house more so it's kind of cool you can just do things to passively uh, heat and cool your house just by arranging things right to begin with uh, or in a, in a creative and and 
in a way that benefits both the plants and your house. So that's, I think that's pretty cool. We planted in an arc around the house to further keep the sun off the walls. And rainwater harvesting tanks collecting water from the roof can be placed to accentuate shelter for the home. High mass materials like earth or stone are best used for the walls and the floor where they can absorb the sun's heat in winter while staying cool in the summertime. Insulation on the outsides of the mass walls will help keep them cool in summer and warm in the wintertime. A correctly sized overhang will block the sun from shining in the windows during the summer. Ideally in summer, you can cook in an outdoor or detached kitchen to avoid heating up the house more. So this is- And, and you know, you may think, well, if I, if I live in the city, uh, I may not even have a patch of, of outdoors to myself. Um, there, there are ways to, to get around that or, or to design things well in the first place. Um, even for apartment complexes or condo complexes, all it might take is, is a balcony, you know, and made out of fireproof materials, of course. Um, and then at least you can cook some of your food outdoors uh, during the, the summertime help keep some of that hot, that heat out of your your place um, and then again those balconies those can be one of those those uh, valuing the marginal um, it can be uh, that that principle can be applied to balconies so the space that as I have have observed I, I spend a lot of time in, in downtown Minneapolis and St. Paul for my job and I look around and, and virtually every high rise especially the newer ones has uh, a balcony for every unit and it's almost never utilized for anything more than maybe maybe a small table and, and a couple of chairs but that has huge potential uh, they still get enough light that you can grow fruits and vegetables um, you can you can utilize the just the walls uh, of, of the building by putting up a trellis for for vining foods to grow up which will themselves help shelter your building as well see all these things they, they synergize with one another. They, they, you know, you get a benefit, they get a benefit. They get a place to grow and, and reproduce. You get food and, and uh, a lower heating and cooling bill. Um, so there's ways to creatively get around these sorts of limitations because, I mean, let's face it, over 50% of Americans live in cities now. And that includes suburbs, I think, in that statistic. But still, more and more, they're moving into the the. Uh, urban cores of cities um, for various reasons that the reasons don't necessarily matter as much as the fact that they are doing it so we have to plan things in, in ways that that we can apply these permaculture principles to their living situation as well so not just the if you have you know 40 acres to, to play around with this is a really simplified version of an idealized desert house of course there are many many different configurations and styles and building materials and many different uh, indigenous methods and examples that we can look at um, great diversity so now we're I think that's supposed to be a, a rain barrel to catch the the storm runoff from the the top of the roof um, you can get quite a lot of, of water just from your average size houses rooftop you think about it, uh, you just take the, the square footage of the roof and then you look at the rain event. If it's a one inch rain, that's one inch multiplied across, you know, whatever square footage you have. And that can add up to quite a few gallons pretty quickly. And that's stuff that you can store, that's energy you can catch and store to, relay, to release later on. Um, so the plants in your yard may have gotten a good drink that day, but what if you're going into a drought? You can then uh, use that water much more um, slowly and over time to, to even out those those cycles of, of dry and, and wet. Um, just one easy passive technique you can use to, to catch and store energy and utilize it more efficiently, uh, as well as making your landscape at the same time more resilient because it then can adapt to perhaps the shocks of drought or, or flooding more easily. We're gonna look at the temperate zone house. Uh, you've heard collecting rainwater is illegal. I think that's kind of a misconception. I don't think there's any municipality in the entire country that you can't put up a rain barrel on your house. I may be wrong on that. 
Uh, what that usually refers to is, is people that have large acreages who might want to, say, divert an entire stream onto their property, right? Um, there's a whole complex layered system of water rights, you know, basically anywhere you go in the country, but especially in the arid western part of the United States. There's all these complicated structures of who gets rights to what water. Because if you think about it, um, if you get irrigation for your farm from a river, well, what if your your neighbor up 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 river wants more irrigation and and more irrigation for the neighbor above them, on and on and on? Is it only the people that are the 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 furthest up on the river that should have access to that water? Probably not. That's not a really fair and equitable system. So they've come up with this really complex structure. So I think. Illegal rainwater harvesting is more to do with that sort of thing. It's like on a massive scale. I really doubt there's any place that's going to bother with, you know, your 55-gallon drum of, of rainwater or that sort of a thing. And there are some places, too, where it's kind of dumb the way they regulate water, where you can't even, like, create a, a, a pond that's that's completely separated from any waterway. But just the idea of, of creating a, a pond, um, like just an impervious ditch on your on your land is is illegal i have heard of that um and that doesn't make any sense to me that that only helps the the local uh ecology because you're you're catching and you're storing energy and more uh again you're evening out those those cycles of of drought and and flooding it, it can only benefit the area but mostly what when they're talking about rainwater rights it's 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 stuff like that for a large scale i heard of one car wash i think it was in colorado i don't even i, I don't think i'm going to take the time to even look up the source but there was a car wash that wanted to use rainwater and they were diverting a whole lot of rainwater like they had a huge property for some reason and they were diverting it all so they could wash cars and i guess the government had a problem with that but yeah in general i don't think it's it's a you know I don't think it's an issue for just your average person to do it on your own small property. Um, yeah. In the temperate zones, orientation towards the sun is a must, as light becomes more limited during the winter, the further away you get from the equator, where the temperate zones are primarily located. Making sure that the building is elongated to the east and west, with lots of glazing on the sun-facing side, will bring light and warmth in when the sun's lower on the horizon during fall, winter, and spring. An attached greenhouse is a great idea for capturing heat in the temperate zone. And I had discussed, and um, I think this is probably going to be the next uh, big idea that I, I try and flesh out of, of my own ideas, but I had discussed on, on the previous stream about permaculture the idea of having um, passive solar in an apartment complex, like on a large scale, using a greenhouse. So thinking about a temperate climate where, where things get really cold in the wintertime, what you might be able to do is have uh, a, basically a horseshoe-shaped uh, or a U-shaped, if you will, property, or, or building that is, maybe five, six stories tall. You want to have it at least that high, um, and you'll see why. So, so basically you have um, a U-shape. And when I go into this idea more, I'll draw everything out so it's a little more easy to understand. But basically, if that, that courtyard that's then created, like in the middle of the U, uh, is facing southward, and then you take the top of that, and then the front side of that, that courtyard, and glass that in, you're saving the money of having to have an entirely glassed-in greenhouse. Because glass can get expensive, especially for that scale. Uh, but then also, you have... Um, the, the thermal mass, you remember he was talking about uh, thermal gain of, of different materials, you have that thermal mass in uh, embodied in the building itself. So the sun shines in through the greenhouse, it, it gets absorbed uh, by the, the, the walls and, and the ground of, of the, the building and then the ground in the courtyard, and then it re-radiates as heat, a portion of that light, and then it gets trapped by the greenhouse. It's literally the greenhouse effect, right? And so just by doing that, maybe we could create some spaces to, without any other inputs, prolong a growing season, if not 
Uh, perhaps if it's done in a really thoughtful way, you could even have year-round growing in that courtyard. And then you're putting food production and living right next to one another. We talk about, we've talked about maximizing that edge um, as well as integrating rather than segregating. Those are, those are, that's one um, example of using those two concepts together. So you could have the people of that, that apartment complex manage that space however they see fit. Maybe they just want to have it a park, a nice place to, to relax in the dead of winter when it's still green and growing. And if it's, you know, a minimum of five stories tall, then you have space to grow most of the sorts of trees you'd want to grow. And anything that would be even larger than that, um, you either just don't use or you, you manage in a way that you keep it chopped down, right? But that takes more work better to just plan out things right ahead of time. And if you really wanted to, you could have an even taller complex and then you could have even taller trees in the middle as well. And another benefit is that you could have, um, like if you're, if you're really uh, pushing that, that, that temperature during the winter to the point where things can, you know, nothing is freezing over, things are still growing, you could potentially have tropical plants in that middle part that you could then grow say a mango from or an avocado or something else that's not locally available in temperate climates something that you would otherwise have to go to the grocery store for you could have right there there's 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 no better tasting food than the food that's picked right fresh right there and used you know within a few minutes of it being harvested um at the same time we're, we're getting more gains through that we're, we're taking less trips to the grocery store we're interacting with neighbors more where we're doing things together as a community, starting to build that community feeling amongst one another, if things are handled well. What you don't want to have is, is the, the situation of like a homeowners association taking the whole thing over, and then the people with the most time on their hands just kind of dictating the way it's managed. Much better to have a, this be a housing cooperative where every resident gets one vote in, in, in uh, the workings of um, the housing and then also this this green space as well so these these ideas although are they're usually uh, applied to rural areas areas with large acreages they can be applied to suburbs they can be applied to dense urban areas as well we just have to plan things right ahead of time as we're building new things or wherever possible just kind of ad hoc retrofitting things to to fit our, our new purposes but it's entirely possible so so uh yeah the point of that was i'll be definitely going into that concept a, a lot more deeply in a future stream but but for now let's let's keep with this um the structure will lose more heat than it gains on the non-sun facing sides of the house so limiting glazing on the shady side in the west is best the east side catches the morning light and the southeast or northeast if you're in the southern hemisphere is a good place for glazing as well. In most locations, the coldest winds will come from the direction of the poles. So evergreen trees on the poleward side help to block cold winds. In really cold climates like Iceland, houses may be dug into the ground <laughs> for wow. temperature moderation. High insulation it's like is- a, It's like a hobbit sort of dwelling. And those things are, are, are really good at moderating temperature. Once you start getting to, you know, having most of your, your building below ground, then you're less a part of the, the surface level um, cycle of, of weather. You're more a part of the, the subsurface level. And the subsurface is pretty constant year round. You're going to have about 50 degree um, temperatures no matter, you know, no matter the season, basically. There'll be a, just, a, just a little bit of fluctuation from season to season, but not a real noticeable amount, which means instead of taking air necessarily from the outside, which may be in the negative degree Fahrenheit or Celsius, and having to warm it all the way up to whatever temperature you're comfortable with, and at the same time in the, in the summertime taking hot air and having to cool it down to whatever temperature you're comfortable with, you have that built-in air already that that's already around 50 degrees that you just have to warm or cool to your liking it's a lot less energy needed so you're relying on the, the geothermal stabilization of of your your temperature essential 
because you can't rely on the sun to heat the building's interior mass during the winter, when it can be cloudy for long periods in the temperate climate. Heating is needed during the winter, and insulation helps to keep that heat in, so you need to use less and less fuel to stay warm. There are incredibly efficient wood stoves that have been developed, like the rocket mass heater and Russian oven, which we've provided links to for it. Okay, so the idea with these, these, these different wood stoves um, is that they, they, they are very efficient in converting the carbon material into um, heat uh, to, to heat a, a very, uh, or to heat a, a normal size space efficiently. Um, and then they combine that with a thermal mass. So they're, they're pumping heat as they're storing as much heat as possible into say a big uh, brick um, surround or, or adobe surround so that it then re-radiates out slowly over time. It's the same sort of thing. It's that catching and storing of energy. So you, you produce a lot of heat all at once, very efficiently, and then slowly over time, it radiates out into the space. So instead of having to constantly heat, you're doing it a little bit really well and then getting the benefit for a long time. And they can become so efficient, especially these, these I guess both are really efficient, but they can become so efficient that Essentially, your only byproduct is um, a little bit of steam because you're not going to burn the water. It's never going to get so hot to like break down the water molecules. So you get a little bit of steam and, and, and then carbon dioxide. And that's the only thing coming out the, the, the pipe at the end of it. So it's super efficient compared to any other sort of uh, heating source. And, and it's to the point where you can do it. I think they said that um, an average size home, you can heat entirely for I think they've gotten down to like a one quarter of a cord of wood. I don't know. I don't remember exactly how big a cord is, but but imagine a l very large pile of wood. So you'd only need a quarter of that, whereas just a regular wood burning stove might be an entire cord, two cords or more, to to heat that same space. So it's pretty cool. These 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 are what's known as appropriate technologies that make good use out of of the resources we have to help us conserve. Um, and I mean, if you get it to that point, you can potentially, if you have enough trees on your, your land, potentially just take a few each year, um, maybe one or two, and then, uh, use that as your, your entire heating source. And then enough trees are, are growing up to take their place that you, you, you never are worrying about deforestation completely. For you. We want to use as little fuel to warm the structure and hold the heat in as long as possible with high insulative design. So that's basically the temperate climate house. And now we're going to move on to the tropics, where heating is certainly not an issue. Cooling is... Mm, wasn't talking about speakers. I think you're thinking of someone else. ...the primary need for building design in the tropics. There's no need to orient towards the sun, but structures should be oriented towards cooling breezes with shade maximized around the rest of the dwelling for cooling. In the tropics, there's no dormant season. So insects, reptiles, and mammals are all very active year round. It's not entirely true. There's definitely seasons that are, I mean, there's like the wet and the dry season in, in once you get to the tropics. So in the drier season, things do tend to slow down. It's not exactly dormant. He's technically right in that, but you're not going to be having the same level of harvest year round. So it's important to, to keep that one in mind. To help keep critters outside of the house, many traditional buildings are elevated up on piers. People I never met or voted for get to manipulate the value of money. <laughs> so it's just like you see political and you think it's just, you know, an open forum to talk about whatever conspiracy theory you have, huh? get to manipulate the value of money. Yeah, that sucks. We should have more uh, more of an egalitarian society, right? You know, I, I think so. How are you going to put that into place, especially if you don't have any sort of government? <sighs> they just want to waste my time. Yeah, I, you know, sometimes it's fun just to kind of play around with trolls. In general, I agree. But yeah, your issue is definitely with capitalism. Is it with fiat currency? Okay, do you think if we were on the gold standard, somehow that would be different, that it wouldn't be just some made-up number based on an arbitrary assignment of how valuable gold is? Gold doesn't have any 
doesn't have much inherent value. You use it for electronics some. Uh, I, it's used in, in um, what else is it even used in? I mean, you can't eat it. You don't really make anything durable out of it. Maybe ornamentation, but it doesn't have a whole lot of intrinsic value. So how is, how is going to some sort of gold standard, which is I assume where you're going with this, or, <laughs> I mean, if you're even more ridiculous in your thinking, oh, blockchain, there we go. That's that. So how, so how is, <laughs> are you literally saying that blockchain is not fiat currency? Do you know how um, Bitcoin got its first valuation? It was worth nothing when it first came out. Are you serious with this? When Bitcoin came out, it wasn't worth anything until someone used like 800 Bitcoins to pay for a pizza delivery. And then suddenly it had value. That's fiat currency, my dude. Like, come on. Hates fiat currency, loves crypto. Yeah, brain worms. Absolutely true. Crypto has a limited amount. It's still fiat. Do you know what fiat means? Fiat means it only has the value that we as individuals or we as humans place on it. It's an imagined value that we all just agree on. That's the value. It's still a fiat currency. There's nothing tangible in the real world that, 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 it, that crypto is linked to. You could destroy all the servers and there's no more fiat currency. Like none. You don't ever get it back. Okay? Except Doge, how is Doge any different? Doge is tanking in value too, isn't it? But anyway, enough of the sidetracks. Come on. It, it, just because this is a political stream doesn't mean that any, you know, half-baked conspiracy is, is fair game here. Let's, let's keep to the issues that we're talking about here. Do you have anything to say about permaculture? Right. You're right. What value does gold have other than its scarcity? You got it. How is that somehow better? These, these are all, in, in one degree or another, fiat currencies. They only have value because we agree they have value. That's what all currency is. Unless we're trading, like, <laughs> you know, chocolate seeds or cocoa beans or whatever. Or, or something else that literally can be used to produce something for ourselves, then every currency is, is to one degree or another a fiat currency. It makes no difference. But let's keep on track here. That, that's enough of that. I'm not going to entertain this kind of crap anymore. Chickens, guinea fowl, and other domestic birds forage underneath, keeping the insect populations down. In this picture from San Pedro, Belize, you can see the kitchen is on <laughs> ground <laughs> level with the bedroom. <laughs> I love a roofing nail-based economy. There you go. That, that literally has more value than gold, okay? Everyone needs a roof over their head. The best way to do that is to nail together stuff with, with, with uh, roofing nails. Much more useful than gold. I'm, I'm all for the roofing nail economy. Elevated above. It's common to have the kitchen detached from the main dwelling so as not to heat the space up during cooking. Structures are often made of light, permeable material, so air can move through with wide overhangs in every direction to prevent against heavy rains and add shade around the building, as well as trees. There's many other details depending on the site, especially in hurricane-prone locations. Sure. So that was a really quick breeze through a very vast subject. My goal is to just whet your appetite so you can go out and find more. We provided a number of links. I, I was not aware that there was a village in Scotland that developed a nail-based trading system. Good as any other, you know, there's, there's a limited supply. People all have to agree that it has value. We, we can actually see the value of nails um, beyond just there being a, a placeholder for usually labor um, or, you know, the, the price of whatever good we've also somewhat arbitrarily arrived at. Um, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Cool. Permaculture is for people that own land. That's where you're wrong, my friend. Permaculture is for anyone. I live in an apartment. I don't own, I don't own any private property. I have a car, but I don't use that for my business. So it's just my personal property. I don't own a single piece of, of private property. I cannot produce my own means of production. I'm, I, other than this, I, this could potentially be my means of production, but that's getting off the point. The point being... I still do permaculture in my, my place. Do you see these, these, these plants behind me? You can grow plants too. Those plants can do a lot of things for you. They can, they can provide beauty. They can provide medicine. They can provide food for you. Um, and I don't have a really large place. Like, 
I'm in my bedroom right now, but my living room is, is not all that much larger than my bedroom. And then if you have a balcony, well, the, the possibilities just multiply. You have vertical outdoor spaces that you can utilize as well. It's, it's, it's more about imagination and, and your ability to be creative and to combine things in new and novel ways than it is about owning a particular amount of land. Anyone can do permaculture. Land back. That's, that's, that's a, a worthy cause as well. Let's, let's respect the treaty, <laughs> at least the treaties, at the very least. Um, but yeah, it, indigenous people need, um, need, need what's been promised to them. Um, and yeah, we, we do need to all recognize that we are all on, on stolen land to one degree or another, and we need to reckon with that. Um, and that, that definitely should factor into permaculture as well and into any sort of uh, leftist philosophy. The idea of of justice for everybody, right? All right, let's move along. It's to get you started learning about climate appropriate structures. So I encourage you to browse them and teach yourself. Well, uh, we're building a community now. This will have a lot of tie-ins, not only with, with um, leftist philosophy, but also um, uh, with new urbanism. Because at the core of new urbanist ideas is, is fostering community, increasing the number of interactions between community members, um, physically getting community closer together so that we can increase those interactions, and, and again, multiplying those synergies. That, that, that like if you, if you live close enough to where you work, you don't have to rely on a car as much or at all. Um, if you have safe biking infrastructure, you can get even further and still have access to a lot of stuff. Um, and then if you have the jobs in the same place that you work, the, the, the benefits just, just keep on stacking on top of each other. Okay, so F the government is your wisdom. That's, that's cool. Um, there's a lot of problems I have with, with government, especially when it is controlled by hierarchical institutions such as... as um, Private enterprise, private businesses, large corporations, these things that, that control so much of the government, especially in, in my country of the U.S. Yeah, there's some big problems with that. We need to get money out of government so that it can be controlled by the people once again, if it ever even was, which I have some big doubts about that. But yeah, government by the people, for the people. I, I definitely can get behind that sort of a thing. Um, and you, you can't... You can't completely get rid of any sort of governing structure. Even a family unit has government, right? You're not gonna, <laughs> you, you have rules that you have to live by, uh, no matter what position you have in, in the family. You have expectations um, and you have duties to one another. Uh, it's no different than any sort of government structure, it's just on a very small scale. Um, there's, there's concepts of justice, especially if you have young kids, th that comes up a lot. Um, so knowing that government is just the way that humans organize the rules for interacting with one another, what sort of government do you want to have? Do you want to have one that's very top down and, and you know, you get rules from on high, from perhaps far away places that, that don't really care about you or, or what you do? Or do you want to have a more localized form of government? Um, do you want to have a more participatory, participatory form of government wherever possible? These are the sorts of questions you should be asking yourself. Dual power structures are also critical. Um, dual power structures are when you say form an organization to do like a food not bombs um, sort of endeavor where you're just getting and, and distributing food for free, providing one of the basics of, of life to your local community. That can be a dual power structure. You are filling in where the local official government has has failed um so yeah that, that these are, these are very important but they also are government structures right there's 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 um rules and to some extent a hierarchy in any organization even if it's very flat and, and democratically controlled you're still going to have people that are more invested and less invested and people that that uh, make more decisions and less decisions, and that's okay. But it's still a government structure. It just happens to be one in uh, that's not officially recognized and 
trying to pick up where the official government structure leaves off. And you can do that with anything. You can do it with housing, you can do it with transportation, um, community self-defense, doesn't, doesn't matter. You can do it with, with any of these sorts of things. All very important. <laughs> you work for the state government nine months, uh, Ali Osher, and you're not evil also. No. Uh, oh, no, we're getting into gulag jokes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, my, for those who may not know, my, my educational training is in basically local government. I have my master's in urban planning. Um, and one of the main things that people do with that degree is, is go to work for uh, various city departments. A lot of it's like um, things like zoning, being on the on, uh, deciding what, what zoning codes are going to be and, and um, uh, code enforcement. That's also a very big one. Uh, sign enforcement, um, but it can be things like the Parks and Rec Department, um, Housing Department, anything that local government would deal with, uh, even up to city administration. A lot of people don't even know about the structure of city administration. It's not all just the city council and, and the mayor. Um, there's the, the, that's the elected side. There's the unelected side, which is, is put in place by the city council to carry out their wishes, basically, uh, and that's the city administrator. Um, that's generally the title of it, city administrator. Um, but they have a lot of power in, in shaping the way that the, the city moves, especially since they tend to be much more constant, whereas the council and the, and the, the mayor come and go at, at the whims of the people. And, and you know, often people use uh, local government as a springboard to state and national. So you have a lot of people coming through. City administrator tends to be more constant. So it was a horrible experience, Alyosha. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, yeah, bureaucracies, especially when they get to be very big and old and, and ad hoc and, and, you know, you have just rules glued upon rules from previous legislative bodies. Maybe, maybe some of them con contradict one another. Maybe some of them are on the books, but you don't follow just by tradition. You know, it can be very frustrating. There's a lot of ways that it can be frustrating work, for sure. Remember in the section on site analysis, we addressed the question... And... and you know, we'll get back to the site analysis. It's just this is just the order that I put the videos in. They didn't have a, an actual order on on OSU's YouTube page, so I just kind of piece them together. But we'll get back to site analysis, so don't worry if you feel like you've missed something. We'll definitely address site analysis. Where am I? In this section on community, we start by asking the question, "Who am I?" In a large part, who we are is defined by our relationships with others and to our community. I'm a father, a husband, a beekeeper, a stonemason, a gardener, a designer, a builder, a teacher, a helpful neighbor, and other things. Each role I play connects me to some part of my community and builds the fabric of a society. When you practice permaculture, you become a part of the community that shares seeds, sells eggs, gives farm tours, plants trees. Permaculture is a beneficial thing that creates abundance where you live, enhances the local ecosystem, and creates surplus yields, which are great to sell, trade, and give away. It's easy to make friends when you have way too many figs. There are also individuals and families who tuck themselves away and live a simple, peaceful life of permaculture, remote from society, and some who are radically self-reliant and want nothing to do with society at all. I say to each their own, living connected to the land and providing for oneself while enhancing natural systems has intrinsic value, regardless of whether or not that's shared with other people. I personally am, am not for that sort of isolationist mentality. I mean, sure, if people really insist on it, then, then I wouldn't try and, and stop them, but it's just, I, I don't think that's the way that humans are, are designed to live as a species. We are, we are communal animals. We, we, we're designed to do things together. Um, so pretending that you're not and, and trying to live out by yourself, I mean, for one thing, you know, that's, that's nearly impossible. You're at least going to have tools that you rely on from outside. You're probably going to be taxed to some degree, so you have to have some sort of income, so on and so forth. You're not going to get absolutely everything you need on your own. So you are going to be reliant. But the idea that you think that you're not, I think that can be dangerous. 
um, can lead to some of the sort of right libertarian thinking that I think is just not helpful to anybody, um, including people that practice it. But that's just my own thought. Remember again how we learned about the grid that is superimposed over the watershed tree. The grid not only disturbs the natural hydrological cycle, but it defines the way cities and towns are arranged. At least in the US, the land has been subdivided and commoditized into blocks, with the spaces in between controlled by cities and counties. Oh boy, I put it way down there. We'll do that video next. I'll move that up in the queue. Public gathering areas are in short supply and people are discouraged or forbidden from altering the landscape outside of their property boundaries. I'm gonna show you a quick series of slides from the excellent work of my friend Mark Lakeman in Portland, Oregon. Mark founded an organization called City Repair, where they recreate the commons in public spaces. Mark and the Planet Repair Institute have been transforming their urban block with block repair, where you now see slides. They've taken down the fences, created pathways between homes, created communal gardens, integrated water systems between properties, built a neighborhood sauna, and transformed the adjacent intersection into a public square. You can see Mark's visionary illustrations of the future permaculture Republic of Portland. That's where I want to live. Here are some other images of communities that are laid in more dynamic patterns. Mm, well, that's interesting. So what we have here is a hexagonal block design. Um, I've thought about this actually myself as, as an alternative way to uh, do city blocks if we put them into hexagonal designs. And my thought was to have uh, basically, let's see how well, I don't know if you can see it that well actually behind me. Let me shrink my thing down just a little bit so you can see. Um, so my idea was that if we were to uh, just start with the one hexagonal piece in the core, and then you'd have six that would go all the way around it, uh, that would constitute one neighborhood. Um, and then you would have space in between each of these, these neighborhood chunks uh, that would be just uh, wilderness space, essentially. And it would be for recreation, but also it would make it so that um, animals could move through freely without coming into contact with humans necessarily, which would be a, a good thing for, for everyone involved. You'd have, uh, you know, just, just less bad interactions with animals if they could move through a community without having to, like, be on city streets, right? Because the way it is now, habitat tends to get fragmented. Uh, we develop so much of the land, or we have developed so much of the land across so much of this country that you may have, say, a state park in one place, uh, but then that's surrounded by farm fields, and, and then you get to urban areas. And basically, if an animal needs to, to move from one state park to a different park or a different area, or they're just migratory in general, they have to interact with, with people's land more. Um, so this would be a way around that sort of thing. So that's interesting that, that there's actually someone that came up with this idea of hexagonal design. The reason I chose hexagons myself is because it's, it's the, the, the merger between a circle, which is kind of the natural form, and a square, which is more like the man-made form, right? So a, an equilateral hexagon is the most sides of an object you can have where if you put bunches of them together, if they tessellate, right, that they, they, there's no space in between. If you have seven sides trying to, to put them together into blocks, there would be spaces in between. You just, it, geometrically, it doesn't work out. Um, yeah, interesting. Cool. But, you know, let's move on. Patterns. I want to remind you of the permaculture principles. Uh, this, this would be another sort of a thing where there's spaces in between the living areas where, where animals can just move freely. Um, you still have relatively the same density as if it were in organized in traditional square rectangular blocks. But instead of it covering the entire land, you have these, these extra spaces. And those extra spaces could be uh, places where you manage them communally. Right? I don't particularly like this design. I don't really like cul-de-sacs too much. I think they are 
anti-community. They, they're very uninviting. Like you have to have a reason to, to go there. Otherwise you're treated with suspicion. Um, you can't just happen down a cul-de-sac. So it really limits the places that you are allowed to go within your city. Um, and I, I, I think that's just anti-community. Uh, sounds like you're funding by Big Protractor. <laughs> yeah, you caught me, Big Protractor, man. I have not used a Protractor in, in quite some time, probably since high school, I would say. <laughs> integrate rather than segregate. We should design our systems around harmonious social interactions between people. My permaculture teacher, Brad Lancaster, called it placing nets in the flow. Hmm, I like that idea. I'll, I'll let him explain that. We'll see where he's going with it and then I'll give my own thoughts. People flow around a site like exactly. water in the same way that we want to spread water out across the landscape so it has more contact with the earth and can soak in and move more slowly through the watershed instead of rapidly flowing downhill. We wanna make places for people to pause in public spaces so they can meet their neighbors and community. This is at the, at the core of new urbanist ideas, is having more spaces to interact. Um, one of the terms they like to use is, is the permeability of the streets. So like if you have a, a shopping district how easily can people flow in and out of buildings, onto the streets? Um, you know, it, it tends to make places more inviting, places that people want to go to, be, to begin with. And if enough people want to go to a place, it just naturally coalesces more human interactions, which, which is the, the, the beginnings of, of community, of building a real community. It's just, just literally interacting with one another. Um, that's cool. Instead of rushing from work to home, back to work, without being connected to the people around them. So every bench and signboard becomes a net in the human flow, a place of potential relationship. A permaculture design system is strengthened by the number of connections between elements. The rainwater harvesting tank blocks the wind and noise from the road while acting as a trellis for an edible climbing vine. So this is that stacking functions that I was mentioning earlier. Each thing supports another thing and supports many functions, and each function is supported by many elements. In the same way, a community is strengthened by the number of connections between people. When you design with people in mind, then community will emerge. Function follows structure. If you build a bench, people will stop and sit. And if grapes hang over that bench, then they'll sit and eat. And when someone else comes by, they'll stop and talk. And that's the beginning of world peace. That's so we're gonna talk question. now about permaculture site analysis. We've already looked at the global climate, providing a starting point to answering the where am I question. And the process of site analysis and assessment is the process of answering that question. So we start from the macro view. There we go. That's understand cool. the major forces influencing our sites, and then we zoom in closer. At this point, I wanna show you where the information I'm presenting fits into the overall process I'm teaching you, which I call the permaculture decision-making matrix. As we saw last week, the matrix has four components, topography, sectors, zones, and principles. And these influence our decisions about why to place what, where, in a permaculture system. For the whole rest of this course, I'll be explaining the details of how to use this matrix to create your design. So does permaculture include everything? Well, yes, it pretty much does. But we only have four weeks here in this course, so we're gonna focus on the design of landscapes. Permaculture is most well known for its potent land design tools, which can improve the world around us, from gardens, to farms, to towns, to refugee camps. One set of tools we have is something I like to call the permaculture decision-making matrix. This tool has four elements that we'll learn about in this course. The elements of the decision-making matrix help us to make an informed choice about where to place objects within the landscape 
and how to relate them to each other. We begin with topography and reading the landform. The way the land is shaped tells us how water moves through it and reveals the way soils are formed and distributed. Understanding the patterns of water movement is a key component to designing a permaculture system because the design for water on a site provides the underlying bones that the rest of the system is structured around. We design for water in a way that creates abundance and keeps water in its place of highest potential so we can use it again and again as it moves through our site. Aside from topography, we have a thing we call sectors. Sectors represent directional forces that come from outside the site in. This could be sunshine, warm or cold winds, storms, wildfire, frost, noise, pollution, or anything else that points in from outside. We map these sectors and then our design becomes a direct response to them. I wanna welcome the sun in winter, block or deflect wildfire, shade from hot summer sun. The next element is what we call the permaculture zones. Zones have to do with how people move throughout a site and the placement of elements in relation to their proximity to the center of human activity. From things that require daily attention that are close in, all the way to areas that are left wild and untouched that are farther out. For example, a vegetable garden I want to visit every day should be in close proximity to the house and get good sun and not get flooded by rain. Unless I'm in the desert, and then maybe I want to channel rain directly into the garden and place it where it gets some shade. You get the point. Every element has reasons to be placed in one spot or another, and the decision-making matrix helps you make that choice. Then, the different elements of your system relate to each other, and this is where the permaculture design principles really come in. The principles guide design decisions and give us a theoretical backbone for the design and interconnection of the pieces of our life support system. Gardens, trees, orchards, fields, forests, structures, energy systems, and social, economic, and political structures as well. When we describe the orientation of an object in relation to the sun, we call that its solar aspect. Depending on what the solar aspect of the side of an object will determine its microclimate. A microclimate is an area that has a distinct climate that differs from the area around it. It can be as small as a few square feet or meters or as large as many miles or kilometers. Some things that may determine a microclimate are solar aspect, topography. So for instance, uh, if you're in the, the northern hemisphere, the northern side of your house is going to be a slightly different climate than the southern side. It's, it's not going to get nearly as much sun. You're going to have to have uh, plants that are much more adapted to shadier conditions. Um, it's also not going to get reflection from uh, the building. Uh, so you're not going to have to worry about as high of, of heat as well in those spaces. So it's going to be cooler. It's going to be darker. Um, and that can be just, you know, opposite sides of your house and have a, a slightly different climate because the average temperature is going to be different in the shade than in the, the direct sun. So just a small example. Soils, water bodies, built structures, and vegetation. Understanding microclimates is really important when it's time to place plants so we can take best advantage of the heat cold, protection, moisture, dryness, or whatever that microclimate provides that a plant species likes. Understanding the microclimate a particular plant thrives in is also a tool to help us in reading the landscape. Noticing microclimates is an observational tool that will make you a better designer. For instance, where I lived in the high desert of Arizona, there was a plant called manzanita, or Arctostaphylus. That plant requires fire as part of its regeneration. So wherever you see that plant in abundance, it's what is called a fire-dependent plant. There's a lot of plants that, that are 
that is their survival strategy is is to be the first to to repopulate an area once a wildfire flyer no wildfire flyer wildfire comes through um plants such as fireweed it's gonna be one of the first flowers you see to pop up after a uh, forest fire in a lot of areas um, i know it's at least in in temperate zones like in, in my state of minnesota uh plants like the jack pine um, jack pine seeds come with in, coated in a kind of wax and it takes the the heat of a forest fire to to melt that wax and for them to germinate because they they thrive well in disturbed areas they also happen to be one of the the plants that moose like to eat most so they can it can be a real benefit for moose after a fire after a wildfire to to have this particular plant to to come eat um, but yeah there's lots of plants that are, are really strange that way but um you can be sure that that virtually any weed that you deal with on a regular basis is some sort of pioneering species, uh, a species that is adapted to deal with low nutrition, low moisture or high moisture, um, you know, blazing sun, really frigid conditions, all, all these sorts of extreme conditions. That tends to be what our uh, weed plants favorite areas to go um, or plants that, that pop up when trees fall over. Um, so you'll see most of these weeds naturally occurring on the edges of forests and on areas that have had maybe a mudslide or a forest fire or something like that. So it's important to keep in mind when you're thinking about how to deal with these situations. Landscape. So when you find a thick stand of manzanita on a south or sun-facing or west-facing slope, which is also the direction the prevailing summer winds come from, then you have a potent wildfire sector and that would be a very risky place to locate a home. Also in the Arizona mountains and many other desert areas, the presence of a cottonwood tree means there's water close to the surface. So we're getting into reading the landscape now, uh, really looking for clues. This is, this is a real big part of observe and interact when you're first setting up your design ideas, assuming you're out on a piece of land. There's a really critical part where you can start to read these these different clues about what sort of of energy flows and 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 material flows are just naturally present in your landscape, and it, as he says, it can be uh, really important uh, for identifying where to situate various resources. This is because cottonwood trees need constant moisture and don't tend to send their roots deeper than 10 feet or three meters. So a cottonwood tree may help you find a spring in the desert or let you know that there's year-round moisture in an area. This can be really useful when assessing a piece of land. These are just a couple examples of why learning about and understanding microclimates is so useful and beneficial in your permaculture studies. Yeah, we're, we're really getting through these videos quickly now. Um, a lot of these are, are really short, just tidbits. So if it's if it's going too fast, and you want to ask a question, don't don't hesitate. You know, there's no no problem slowing things down a little bit because it's a lot of information probably coming at you pretty fast. I want to touch on the importance of the cardinal directions in evaluating your site because we're talking about the whole planet. We'll talk about sun facing or pole facing instead of north and south. East and West have the same sun influences in both the Northern and the Southern hemispheres. We're looking at the roof of a house from up above. The sun facing direction of a house or of a hill or a mountain or any vertical object is the hot and dry side. Like I said before, the further you move from the equator, the more relevant this is. And it's completely irrelevant if you live near the equator. If you live on or near the equator, the direction of wind for cooling is more important than the sun sectors. But we'll talk about that later. The east-facing side of an object gets morning light. This means it warms up earliest, which is important, especially when there's frost to burn off on a springtime garden. The west is the hottest side because this is where the sun is shining later in the day when the atmosphere has had time to warm up. The air is hot by midday in summer, and then that western sun makes its long descent into the west, and it can be brutally hot from that direction. Finally, we have the pole-facing side of an object, which is considered the cooler side. 
It's shaded during winter months, which also means that water doesn't evaporate and it's more moist on this side. This becomes more relevant the further towards the poles you are. To understand more about how the sun moves through the sky, see the solar resources page. We're gonna talk now about the permaculture sectors and at the same time examine two of our permaculture principles. So if you recall, the, the sectors are taking inventory of where these various flows are, are coming in and out of your land, where the sun is coming from, the wind, the water, and where it's leaving your, your piece of property. And this can be done even in an apartment, you know, determining what, what windows are facing in which direction. That, that has a big influence on what sort of plants you could grow next to those windows, uh, determining which way your balcony faces if you are lucky enough to have one. Um, also is going to help determine what sort of plants you can grow out there, knowing which way the wind is, is coming up against your house. If you have any sort of outdoor space uh, is also very important. So it, it definitely scales. It's, it's relevant to all scales of, of um, personal property, I guess, even if you, you know, using personal property in a, in a general sense. Sectors are directional forces coming into a site from the outside. We map sectors so we can see what the major influences are on the site that are coming towards us, and then our design becomes a response to those forces. I'll provide an example. Here, we have a house. You know, and, and just a, a, a personal anecdote about that, I, I have to think about these things all the time as a landscape designer. Um, one of the big things that, that I do is I design for large containers. Say, say you have uh, an apartment building and it's got like a, a big um, urn or, or planter right in front of the, the building. Um, I need to know which way that sun is coming from if it's going to be blocked by the trees during the midday. Um, if, if, it, if, it's, if there's an overhang that may block the, the rain from falling directly on it, I need to know that because I need to be able to tell the, the building, uh, the, the property management company, that they need to be out there watering um, if, it's, if it's being blocked from the rain. Uh, which way the wind comes from, you know, especially in, in urban settings, you get what's known as the, the uh, canyon effect, where you have very tall buildings which form an artificial canyon, and the wind just goes, you know, whistling through uh, along, the, along the streets. So you have to know about that sort of thing. So these, these are are very relevant no matter what sort of living situation you find yourself in because it depends uh, all these factors determine what sort of a plant palette that I can use when I'm putting in these container gardens um, I also need to know about foot traffic if it's likely to be stepped on and I need to put in more durable plants or I need to guide people to to stay off of uh, a planting bed or something like that I might, I might use something like roses if I want to really make sure that people aren't coming into a, a certain space. Um, these, are, these are all factors that, that you can look at when you're looking at the different sectors. In the temperate climate zone, where day length and the angle of the sun changes throughout the year. In the wintertime, when it's colder, that sun is a precious commodity. When the atmosphere is clear, solar energy is a renewable resource that can help to heat a structure, providing free lighting, produce electricity, and provide light and heat for plants. So here we have the wind. You can also heat your water too. In fact, in, in places such as Minnesota, um, where we have such short days during, during the winter time, Oftentimes, the most energy efficient way to use the sun is to, to heat water with a solar water heater. And basically, all that is, it's just this labyrinth of, of black piping that you set inside a, a case with a clear front to it that, that faces south. Um, and then whatever sunlight hits that starts warming up your, your water. So one of the biggest energy users in any building is just warming up water. So this is one way that we can cut down on that, especially if you have a partially obstru uh, obstructed um, uh, you know, view of the sun, like maybe there's a, a building that, that shades your building during a certain part of the day. With solar panels, 
as soon as there's any sort of a shadow over it, at least uh, to my understanding, the way that most solar panels work, if there's any sort of a, shade, a shading over it, that efficiency of that solar panel drops immensely just from that one little bit of shadow. It doesn't have to be over 50%, but you might have more than, say, a 50% drop in efficiency just because the way it's wired up. Um, that's not true, though, if you're just doing solar water heating. Any, you know, the, the uh, percentage of efficiency is, is completely dependent on the percent that is shaded or unshaded at any given time, which is another reason why solar water heater may be an option where solar panels are not. Winter sunrise, we have the sun moving low through the sky, we have the winter sunset, and that angle is low and it's hitting the structure. Here I've drawn a, a greenhouse and some solar panels to take advantage of that sun angle in the winter. So from the home, my design response to this winter sun sector is to leave a pie slice open and free of tall trees, buildings, or other obstructions in order to welcome the sun at the times that I most need the energy. So if, if you recall back, if you were here earlier when I was talking about my idea for uh, combining food production with, with apartment living or, or condominium living, um, this is the same sort of thing. The idea, it's often referred to in permaculture as a sun catcher idea. So you leave the entire south face open. Um, so for if, if this uh, one house was instead extended uh, to follow the, the, the sides here, so it was making like a U shape with the south side open or the, the, the you know, noonday sun side open, what, whichever direction that happens to be. Well, if you're in the northern or southern hemisphere, um, we could do the same sort of thing with an apartment complex and then put a, a glass wall on that southern end and across the top and potentially even have a, an entirely different climate inside that, that new courtyard and have the, all the, the built material act as a heat sink that's absorbing that solar radiation during the winter um, and then re-radiating re it out slowly over time. And then if we add, say, a pond maybe even an aquaponic system into the middle of that, that courtyard, we could have an even more efficient solar heat sink, uh, solar energy sink, I should say, that will hold on to that, that, that warmth a lot better and then radiate it out over the nighttime, keeping the, the, the greenhouse in your courtyard uh, at a more consistent temperature. So this is where my design is using the principle of use and value. Well, thank you so much for stopping by Bread Crochets. Um, I, I hope you have a good stream. And I, I think if you're still going at the time that, that I finished up, which will be pretty soon here, I'm not going to go too much longer. Uh, longer. Uh, uh, keep a lookout. I'm going to probably give you the raid tonight. So thank you very much for your contributions. I really appreciate it. You've been You've been a big help and, and a lot of fun. So appreciate you ha appreciate having you around for the stream, and I hope to see you on future streams. Thanks so much. And if you're not following Bread Crochets yet, fantastic leftist uh, streamer who does uh, video live videos of, of themselves crocheting different items, a lot of really cool items too. Like I saw some Mario stuff that, that, that uh, they had done. And at the same time, listening to theory audiobooks, very similar to the way that I listen to theory audiobooks. I think, I think you had mentioned that you do um, text to speech, but it's the same sort of concept as a, as a regular audiobook. Really cool stuff. Go check out Bread Crochets. Are you renewable resources and services? I am valuing the solar sector both in the orientation of the structure to face the light, as well as the placement of other elements that will benefit from maximum light and heat that comes when the sun's low. Pause just for one second. Oh yeah, you're welcome, Ali Osher. Also again, follow Ali Osher if you're not already. Great leftist political streamer. Oh, in the wintertime. The sun is a renewable source of energy, and especially in the temperate climate, orientation towards the sun is a key design pattern. Oftentimes in the temperate climate, cold winds will come from the direction of the poles. So in my diagram here, I will draw the cold winter winds sector. Where I wanted to be 
open to and welcome the winter sun from one direction that's not the response that I want to have to the winter winds. I actually want to block or deflect those winds. So in the pole side of my structure, I want to plant some trees that will have a mass during the winter month. So I'll put some nice, dense, evergreen trees so the wind does not blow at full force right up against the back side of the house. Now, maybe I want to block the rising summer sun coming in due east. So let's look at the summer sun sector for a minute. So what this is supposed to represent um, is kind of a, an elongated version of, of the globe, basically. So the idea being that in, in the summer, the sun is going higher in the sky. If, if you were to track the sun, um, assuming you're not right on the equator, if you were to track the sun in the winter time, you would see it sweep very low. It's never going to get quite to the, the, the zenith, the, the straight up from your position point uh, in the winter time. It's going to get much lower than that. And then the higher up in, in uh, latitude you go, the more, that, the more extreme that is to the point where if you're at the North Pole, there's a, a few points out of the year, or I'm sorry, one point, of, I don't know, a couple of weeks or a month or something like that, where you are completely behind the curve of the Earth and the sun just never comes up for, for those uh, couple of weeks. I think it's just a couple of weeks that that happens. Um, and then uh, during the summertime, since, you, you know, the, the, the tilt is, is more, um, uh, the, the tilt of the Earth makes it so that the sun is more directly overhead. So you'll see it come from one side of your house. It usually is, um, if you're really observant, you'll see that the sun doesn't rise due east or due west, unless you're on the equator. That's a different story. But it's going to be a little bit to, to the northeast uh, when it rises and a little bit to the northwest when it sets. So it's just a sweeping arc across the sky, um, higher in the summer lower in the winter. That's all that's supposed to represent by this drawing. So now we got the sun rising in the east and the trees will keep the house cooler during the hottest times of the year. So these nice deciduous shade trees will lose their leaves in the winter time and still allow that light access on this side, but in the summertime they will shade the house from the east. And maybe there's a big ugly industrial area due west that makes lots of noise and drifts in bad odors when the wind comes from that way. And I also don't want to see that out of my window. Also very applicable if you're in an urban area. There may be some views that you don't like as much. That would be a good place to, to set up some sort of a trellis, some sort of a vining plant or, or maybe a large bush or a small tree, um, especially if you have outdoor space. That might be a good uh, use of, of uh, designing for beauty. That, that's another thing that, that um, not as often talk about, talked about, especially when it comes to permaculture, because the, the focus is so much production. What can we produce, produce, produce? Beauty is another yield that you can have, and it's, it's not as often talked about with permaculture. It's usually sacrificed in favor, um, to, a, to a lesser or greater degree, uh, in favor of uh, production but it's still a consideration that's, that's perfectly valid. So I plant a dense hedgerow of evergreen shrubs and trees to the west, which also block the hot setting sun from hitting the house during summertime. You see, there are elements in my design that are directly responding in some way to the sector forces. So this is an example from the temperate climate and now I'm going to draw another example from the tropics. Closer to the equator where the length of the day doesn't change much nor does the angle of the sun change dramatically throughout the year, structures are not oriented towards the sun like we have in the temperate climate but they're typically oriented towards a different sector which is cooling winds. So this here is a slope site with a forest up off site on the hillside. This site is located in the wet dry tropics, meaning there is both a wet 
and a dry season. This means that during the dry season, along with the prevailing winds blowing upslope in this example, we also have another very important sector force to consider, and that is fire. Now, what happens when we have a major change in this situation? Let's say, for example, that this upper hillside right here is not under our control and gets logged or denuded of vegetation in a fire, and suddenly a once lush and water-absorbing landscape full of all different species and great diversity is now a barren water-shedding landscape. So suddenly, we have this whole other force to consider, and that's the erosive power of water flowing down a slope during heavy rains. So this brings us to our other permaculture principle for this lesson, creatively use and respond to change. This is actually a common situation. Whenever I visit a site that's downhill or downstream from forested land, I always want to find out what the land ownership is in the upper watershed, and if it's expected to be logged, developed, or altered in some significant way. I have actually seen this situation again and again and again. So how can we turn this very common problem into a solution? How can we creatively use and respond to this change? So here's my little brainstorm on this diagram. Basically, is to create these off-contour swales that soak in the surface water flow, then divert the overflow around the central house area into this pond that then mm. spills over into production terraces. Now, this will help to accentuate the cooling force of the wind in the house as the breeze blows over the water and also puts a pond and irrigated beds between the house and this fire sector right here. So now we've used at least two permaculture principles in order to respond to our sector forces. This is the type of thought process that we're hoping to convey when we use the sector compass tool as a design method. And I hope that you can see how important it is to really take your time to assess your sectors as part of the overall process for the permaculture design of a site. Very cool. So here we are right, we're gonna get into back in the permaculture decision-making matrix. This is a very short video, so this is just a very brief overview of zones in the matrix. We've looked at topography, we've looked at sectors, and now we're moving into the next element which are the permaculture zones. We looked at topography. We did look at topography already, didn't we? Just want to make sure I have this in a, yeah, climate and topography. We did. The zones have to do with how people move through a site and how we build, maintain, interact, and move through a permaculture system. The permaculture zone model acts on the assumption that we give more attention to things that we see more frequently. Every site, whether it's a farm, a residence, a business, or park, has a center of human activity, the place where people spend the most amount of time. This could be the house on a site, the barn, or even the parking lot of a place where people just visit and don't live. Of course, some places have multiple centers, but let's just start with one. The center, the very center of the house, is called zone zero inside the house. <clears throat> but the center area around the house is called zone one. Elements are placed in relation to this center based on how much attention they need. So things that require daily attention or are part of the systems of the structure are placed immediately outside zone zero in zone one. Zone one is considered the domestic zone. <clears throat> Let's think about some things that require one or more visits every single day and are connected to the house. A greenhouse, a workshop, a worm bin, salad garden, kitchen herbs, poultry, and other small animals. 
just to name a few. Now zone two is what is thought of as the home orchard. This is still quite close to the house or other structure, so is used for domestic <coughs> self-reliance. The elements in zone two are higher maintenance and require regular visits. Some examples that could be found in zone two are barns, animal housing, wood storage, fruit and nut trees, berries and other small fruits, vegetables, chickens, rabbits, and composting, just to name a few. Now zone three is what we think of as the farm zone. It's visited more infrequently with more extensive methods of cultivation. This is where we might go grow a, crash, a cash crop of vegetables or fruits, orchards, firewoods, pasture, large ponds, hedgerows, and larger animals like cows, sheep, goats, and pigs. Now zone four is what we think of as the forage zone. This zone has minimal care and is used more for hunting, gathering, and grazing. We may harvest firewood, hunt mushrooms, wildcraft herbs, and selectively graze to reduce fuel to protect from wildfire. Now zone five is the wilderness, where we practice very minimal to no management. These are the places we leave to wild nature, and the most we take from them is information about how nature works so we can then use that information to create our own cultivated ecologies. We are learning from natural patterns and processes and mimicking them in our own systems so we can use the functionality of nature in our own life support. And if you're considering about <clears throat> where to situate your house on a piece of land, putting the wilderness area or, or, or having incorporating that wilderness area into um, or, or having let me let me flip it the other way. Having areas that are like critical habitat, for example, um, a certain species of animal likes to nest in, the, in these marshes. Uh, we're next to a very important waterway that we're trying to protect. Uh, there's a particular type of biome, like uh, uh, maybe a, a peat bog or something like that, that uh, is very fragile. If we're thinking about situating zone five, we might want to incorporate those sorts of things into it. Um, just as a, a natural way of protecting these valuable resources. And there's other reasons to keep this, this, this natural buffer as well. Um, it can help keep unwanted plants and animals from just like, say, you know, well, not, not so much the animals, but the plants, you know, say a, a hay truck goes by and, and some hay falls off. Um, if you're too close to the road with your, with your production, it may blow onto your land. You may get unwanted weeds. You may get unwanted um, agricultural crops and stuff like that. The wilderness acts as a buffer for that. Um, remember again that weeds, the things we tend to think of as weeds, tend to be these plants that, that cultivate um, disturbed areas. So instead of having a, a disturbed area that weeds can get a hold of and come in across the land onto your place, you have this wilderness buffer, this very strong, you know, wild, or, or maybe you manage it just a little bit, um, sort of an area. Like, like, even though it's wild, you probably don't want to have some certain invasive species there, right? Um, say, like, in, in my area, buckthorn is a big problem. Again, mostly on, on the, the margins of forests, but still it's a problem. Uh, it tends to take over and form really dense thickets. Uh, you may not want to have that in your wilderness area. So that's an appropriate time or appropriate situation to uh, look at harvesting that sort of thing and putting in plants to fill its same niche. A niche is, is just where uh, a particular plant or animal um, has the best conditions for its survival, right? So in, in the case of buckthorn, like I said, it likes the edges of forest. So if you have... Um, very strong, vigorous plants on the edges of your forest, it, especially very densely um, shading ones, it's going to have a better chance of keeping that buckthorn out. Um, so just an idea if you're wondering, oh, why do I even want to have a, a, a buffer strip of wilderness? Well, this is one reason. The other reason, as I was talking about with my idea for city design, is it gives a place for wild animals to move through that's not straight through your land. So 
keeping it wild gives them natural areas for them to to find the foods they like and eat the foods they like that's not also going to interfere as much with the foods that you're trying to cultivate for yourself and the use of you you know whatever use you have for these different plants for systems now rarely do we have a site where these concentric zones really work out to be in a circular target like i've drawn every site is different and it could be that you have a zone five creek running right through your zone one or the soils and sunlight could dictate could dictate where you put your main garden rather than proximity to the house but the zones give us a basis to work from a starting place which may not resemble this idealized pattern here. Depending on what the conditions you find, you may have to reroute the ideas that you started out with. You may find it's not ideal conditions for uh, having a large vegetable garden because you would have to place it too far away from your house in order for it to be viable. And you'd have to be spending too much time walking back and forth. So by doing this analysis ahead of time, you can save yourself a lot of headache avoid a lot of what are called type one errors and that's an error where you've designed things in a way to make more work for yourself forever for the existence of the the the, the structure that you're putting in um, you can avoid these sorts of things by thinking about this ahead of time um, perhaps you find that your land is just not good for uh, whatever sort of plant or animal that you wanted or in order to have that animal or plant you'd have to put it in an inopportune place this is what these zone analysis can help you figure out. There's also another design layer where elements sit on the border of two zones, for instance. You may tend to your chickens in zone one, but they may forage out in the zone two orchard or the zone three crops. The magic of a permaculture design is in how many beneficial relationships between these elements we can make. For instance, the and again, this, this factors in with uh, um, valuing the marginal and using edges, using the edges and valuing the marginal. We're creating a lot of edge space by having these different zones, a lot of, of, of transitions between one zone and another, where you get the most variety of plants, the most variety of animals, the most variety of conditions that different things can fill a niche for. So that's another reason to do this sort of anal analysis. Chickens are fed by weeds and bugs in zone three, which they turn into fertilizer that's collected from their hen house and used for the salad greens in zone one, which are then added to the compost, which is fed back to the chickens. Or the prunings from the zone two orchard are used as fuel to heat and cook in the house, and then the ashes are returned to the orchard. Again, this, this, this is the stacking functions, and this is one uh, design element supporting another, right? It's, 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 it's it's integration rather than segregation that, that really plays heavily into this sort of a design system. Uh, instead of doing everything one way, you have a lot of different ways of doing things and a lot of different elements that all support one another. It becomes an interdependent community or uh, a biome, you know, an ecological uh, habitat that, that you just happen to be a part of, one of the co-creators of, right? How many connections can we make between elements? How can waste become food no and waste. nutrients cycled around? The web of connections is the strength of a permaculture design. All right, so next we're going to get into design for slope, uh, which I think probably should have been in a different part of the, the playlist. I think I'm going to have to look at it and see if I uh, put things out of order at all. But uh, I think I'm going to leave that for another time. Uh, just because it's getting it's getting late. It's, uh, you know, I've gone two and a half hours. That was about the maximum I wanted to do tonight. Um, actually, let's see how much uptime I have actually. Oh, almost three hours. Well, I definitely got to get off then. <laughs> I have to... Uh, Get ready for tomorrow. I have to be up at five in the morning to go to my job. So, uh, yeah. Any any questions as we're wrapping up here? Feel free to to shout them out. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Are you enjoying this series of videos? Are you are you finding it sparking ideas in you that that you uh, 
um, hadn't considered before. Um, what, what are your thoughts on it? I'd love to know. Um, other than that, let's look at one particular thing. I'm trying to highlight one of my areas of, of uh, my creative endeavors every stream. So I think this time I'll just look at my channel, my uh, YouTube channel, I should say. Ah, you follow me on Facebook. Thank you so much, Allie. I appreciate that very much. And that, that link tree link that I put out also has links to all the different social media I have. Um, so you can follow me there by going to linktr dot ee slash bread underscore theory. And you'll have links to, to my, uh, aside from Twitch, it'll be Facebook, uh, YouTube, my podcast. I put out this audio from these streams as a, as a podcast. Um, and the various projects I have on social media. So you can find all that stuff there. But I just want to highlight my, my uh, particular YouTube channel right now. So this is where I archive all of my past streams. I do an edited version of the video. So I'll edit out, you know, gaps in, in speech. I tend to edit out trolls. So sorry, trolls, you don't make it into the final cut. Um, just because I don't need to give you any more attention and oxygen than you deserve, which is none. Uh, so you have that there as well. Oh, let me pull up my, sorry, pull up my thing again. So you can see uh, I'm a little bit behind in putting videos out. I'm going to try and catch up in the next few days here. But I have all my videos that I've done. I'm um, up to, boy, how many do I have now? This is one, two, three, six, twelve, eighteen. 24, um, 32, I've got about 35 videos up there for you to, to dig into, um, various subjects, uh, and, and you can see my, I organized everything into playlists, I really do like playlists as a way of organizing things, so I have my Conquest of Bread playlist, which is my, my book that I just finished up this, this last Friday, finally, I have the Communist Manifesto, I have some of the intro music that I've used, I've been trying to put together more lo-fi theory videos. Perhaps uh, if you are bored by just people droning on and on and on, this might help you keep engaged a little bit, a little bit more. So I have one from, uh, this is uh, Lo-Fi Brooks. This is um, Michael Brooks, one of his lectures from just over a year ago. Man, uh, what, what a loss that was to, to lose such a brilliant and, and caring and kind person as Michael Brooks, but I've, I've tried to, to help uh, expose more people to his work. It's, it's one of my most viewed videos, actually. Um, so I have that. I have, uh, you can see every video that I like. Um, you can see I have various uh, cues from when I do my streaming from one of my Facebook groups. That's, that's uh, Left Signal Boost TV. A bunch of videos that go through what solar punk is and, and all its different facets and I have a few uh, playlists like that so there's a whole lot to check out here I, what I am now calling Sunday fun day but I used to call it the soda stream so I have all the different it tends to be people that I, I right wingers that I make fun of a lot of the time like this one is Abby Shapiro um, let's see there's one but there's there's one that there's ones that I like as well that I'm just adding my Honest voice to. Life of relative this is a bleep specifically Blanc Ben's video the black on abolishing the suburbs. Into economic phenomenal video. There are many Go ways in which black Americans Blanc during the New Deal era were forced into poverty uh, and struggle. Too many to cover in one video. So I will talk about just a small handful of it. I should have a link to it. I'm going to add a link to it later on to the original video. But he's a, he's a great leftist streamer and uh, also a Minnesotan, which I appreciate as well. Um, so yeah, tons of stuff to check out there on the YouTube channel. I, I encourage you to go explore and see what I have there. Um, and it includes the, the playlist that we've been watching on permaculture as well. So there's a lot of that. And then I, I have a whole bunch, if you're interested in, in discovering some more leftist YouTubers, I have uh, links to just a whole plethora of them. I think I have somewhere over 300 that I've subscribed to. And they're all just uh, publicly available for you to look through, see what catches your interest. Richard Wolf, really great one to subscribe to. Um, Big Joel, you'll see a lot of uh, famous ones, but a lot of lesser known ones as well. Like uh, Brenton Lengel deserves a lot more following. Really great um, 
debater. I call him more of a debater with compassion for his audience and, and his opponents. But then you have, like, you know, Hassan and Thought Slime and, and those as well. So that you can check that out, out also by going to my uh, YouTube page. Uh, yeah, just lots to explore. Lots to explore. All right, well, thank you all very, very much for joining me on this journey. Lectem, I will see you guys hopefully this Friday where we're going to start um, The Principles of Communism by Friedrich Engels. Uh, we just finished The Conquest of Bread, as I mentioned, and we're going to move into The Principles of Communism, which is the, the, the book that um, most people expect the Communist Manifesto to be. Turns out it, it, it doesn't go into very much detail at all. It's, it's, it's basically an introductory pamphlet, the, the uh, Communist Manifesto. So for that reason, uh, people tend to, to leave it wanting more. And this is, this is the more. This is laying out communism as Engels conceives of it in, in very... Um, it's still an introductory text, but it's, it's, it's good enough detail that you'll have a lot more idea of what communism stands for. Because um, it can be an amorphous thing, especially if you listen to right-wingers about what the definition is. Basically, communism to them is anytime the government does things or owns stuff. Uh, and that's just, there's, there's so much more beyond that. So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and raid you into Bread Crochets, who was in the chat earlier. Really cool leftist streamer, once again. You should definitely be following them. Uh, they do crocheting at the same time as listening to theory, um, whether it's an audiobook or uh, whether it's a text-to-speech sort of um, thing that they've pulled up from uh, various sources. Really cool channel. Go check it out.